So this is uh, from a Bible study that I did about 10 years ago um, at Promised Land, where, where is the fellowship where I attend. And um, I, I, I don't know if it took me 15 or 20 weeks to do it. So you're going to get a flyover, <laughs> okay? And I began to study this, and I was just fascinated by the picture that I was seeing, the picture that God uh, had created in the formation of the tabernacle and how it reflects who we are as human beings. And, um, you know, there's several scriptures that tell you that your body is a temple, and so uh, you don't need, uh, need me to tell you those. I hope you already know it. So the first, um, the, the jumping off place for what, where we're going is the Shema. And right after the Shema, it says, And you will love the Lord your God with all your... And... And... Oh, it doesn't say mind. <clears throat> it says strength. But it's not the word for strength, and it has nothing to do with being strong. It's your very muchness. Okay, you have to love God with all your very muchness. Okay, that means like really all of you. We, so uh, we're going to, uh, all your being, okay? Now, when, when we think of the word heart, we think of where our emotions are. But we're going to find out, if we do a study in the Hebrew, what the word for heart is, that it's really the residential place of the spirit, Okay. So all this is, um, and your body is your body, of course. Okay. Um, now all this, the only place that I went to study any of this was the scripture. Okay. And, you know, we had all these teachings, well, you know, this about this piece of science and that piece of science. And just imagine Moses and all those 600,000 guys and all their wives and children, they're out in the desert, and they don't have any science. How, how are they going to manage? You know, how can they understand these things? Well, God is certainly not leaving them bereft, but he gave them the pattern of the tabernacle, which perfectly reflects all these things. So I will tell you that the word um, for heart in Hebrew is lev, or sometimes it says levav. And the soul is your nefesh. And there's a few different words for body. We'll just use the word goof for now. Okay, there's several different words. All right. Now, um, I want you to think about in uh, 1 John 2.16, it tells you what all the temptations. There's only three temptations in this world, and so I guess that you are probably relieved to know that because you thought there were millions of temptations, right? But there's only three, okay? There's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And each one of these things is going to refer to, uh, it's going to be a temptation for each one of these things, right? Well, the lust of the flesh, I guess we can see this. The lust of the eyes we're going to see here. And the pride of life is going to be here, okay? Okay. All right, let's just look at the first temptation. What happened? That snake. He offered her that fruit. Okay? And she looked at it. And what did she see? It was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and it made one wise. Okay? Those things line up perfectly. Solomon had a lot of problems. He had... Uh, I don't know, a lot of horses, a lot of women, <laughs> and a lot of gold. Okay. So there's a lot of parallels for this, and I'm just flying through here <laughs> very quickly. Um, let's see. Uh, beyond, beyond the Shema, let's go over to um, Psalm 84 verse 2, which I don't happen to have here. Maybe somebody would be so kind to read that. Okay, and, and a bunch of people have quoted you First Thessalonians 5.23, that you be um, holy, sanctified, right, in your spirit, soul, and body. Okay, I mean, there's just lots and lots and lots of evidence for this in the Bible. 
Um, can somebody read that? Psalm 84. I don't know if it's two or three, because it must be two if you have a, if a quote Christian Bible. Okay. My heart. Make a lot of noise. My heart and my flesh cry out for God, but my soul is longing and fainting. Okay. It mentions all three three parts, and we'll see why why the two things um, are different. Huh? 84, Psalm 84, 2. Okay. Um, now, if you, if you want to do some more looking up at this kind of stuff, I'll give you the Strong's words for, for the Lev here. Um, it's Strong's uh, 3820. Or... 3824. Okay, so we're going into the tabernacle, and uh, I'm going to draw a picture here. Okay, so this is the outer court, this is the holy place, and this is the most holy place. Okay, you're familiar with that, right? The holy of holies, the holy, the holy place. And we're going to look at all the things that are there. And how they represent you. Now, there's a lot of studies about how these things represent Yeshua, okay? How the menorah represents Yeshua and the showbread and all this. But, but this, I'm going to show you how it represents you and your functions as a human being. So the heart, um, I'm just going to give you so a couple of scriptures here that show how the heart and the spirit are the same thing. Because that's, that's what I wrote. It's all, I said everything comes from scripture psalm 51 10 create in me create in me a clean heart renew a right spirit in me okay that word there for create is the same word that's used for when god created the heavens and the earth it's a word bara it's only used when god creates it's not used when people create something it's only used when god creates something only god can create a new heart in you Proverbs 17.22, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Okay, these things are in parallel. Um, That shows that they're the same. Ezekiel 36.26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. Okay, I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. Okay, there's lots of them. It's the flyover. Okay, when you are born, your heart, your spirit, is in a bad state, right? What does it say in Jeremiah? Deceitfully wicked, there's nothing you can do about it. No man can know it, okay? Um, So you have a, um, a remedy for your heart, which is what is in the Holy of Holies here, okay? This is a spirit man here, the spirit. What's in the Holy of Holies? One thing, it's the ark, okay? I'm going to draw a big ark, okay? But I'm going to tell you how big the ark is, really, because I want to write some things in it, okay? When you are born of the Spirit of God, born again, whatever you want to call it. We're not going to argue about the te- terminology. I hope you know what it means. I hope you all have already made the commitment for it, right? You get God's Spirit living in your heart. That's what, <laughs> what we say, right? The little girl goes to the doctor, and uh, she's got, you know, Barney everything, you know, Barney, little pants, Barney, you know, Barney, the big purple dinosaur, right? The shirt, everything. And uh, the doctor looks at her and says, um, and, and have you got Barney in your heart? And the little girl says, no, Barney's on my underwear. Jesus is in my heart, <laughs> right? And that's our understanding of it, that the Spirit of God comes in your heart. So uh, in, in modern understanding, in English, we say, well, the heart is the seat of the emotions. That's not true. According to the Bible, the heart is the seat of where your spirit is, okay? You can have yourself sitting on that spirit, uh, on that throne, right? It's a throne. You know that the ark is a throne? 
It's a throne, okay? It's built like a throne. It's got that flat place, and it's got those angels, the cherubim, then they make a throne for God. And it, that's, you can find that in Scripture, okay? The only remedy for your deceitfully wicked heart is to be born again and receive the Spirit of God in this place. Uh, you need to circumcise your heart. Oh, and by the way, that's in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 10, 16. Okay? Um, so, uh, in Galatians 5, 16, it says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Everything that you do, okay, eventually we'll see the outer court. That's going to represent our body. Everything that you do in your body starts here. It comes from the Spirit. Everything in life, how you act and your behavior is motivated through from your spirit. That's why if you're not, if you don't receive the Spirit of God, eventually you're going to be running downhill. You're going to be living by the lust of your flesh. You may start by living by some maybe loftier ideas or intellect. Eventually your body's going to run you to the dirt because your body is dirt and has affinity for dirt. And it wants to go to the dirt. That's what it wants to do, okay? You got to be born again. So it's the throne of God who's going to sit there. Hopefully, Yahweh, King of kings, Lord of lords. Proverbs 23, 7, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is, right? Matthew five twenty eight. but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery, in his heart, okay? It's a spiritual issue. Now, uh, what's inside the, uh, the ark here? You know how everything goes in threes? Okay. The tablets. Aaron's rod. And the men. Oh, I guess the rod is more important than Aaron, isn't it? The men. And these things represent things. They represent something. Okay. What is Aaron's rod? How did it get there? You remember? Huh? Good. Authority, leadership, the rules. How did it get there? Right. I want to be I want to be the high priest. Right, so Moses said, everybody, each tribe, bring a stick, right? And they put them all out there and overnight, and all the other sticks were sticks. <laughs> but the one that Aaron brought sprouted, put out leaves and flowers and almonds overnight. Yeah, I guess that was a miracle. So the question was, who's in charge, right? Right. And then we get the answer. So, oh, let's write it in the right place. Authority. Okay. The word for rod we were talking about, right, is um, shevet, which also means tribe. Okay. So your tribal affiliation is also represented by that rod. Um. And uh, if we think about who would be in authority, I mean, what, what's the title of the person who's in authority? He's the king, right? Does the king make the rules? Oh, you bet, <laughs> right? The king makes the rules. He's, the, he's the, the ruler, okay? The rod did all kind of miracles in Egypt. It was that rod. It's a thing that he held in his hand, Okay? Um, we need to look. What, what's in your hand? You know, what, what can you do with what you're holding in your hand? So we have the authority, the rulership, uh, under the auspices of the king, and also your tribal identity, your tribal identity. If you, um, you can be born Italian, you can be born German, you can be born Zambezi land, if there is such a place, I don't know. Maybe you're a Martian from another planet, I don't know. When you become a Hebrew, you cross over. That's your tribal identity, okay? Don't try and find out if you're Dan or, you know, Naphtali or anything. That stuff is irrelevant. The important thing is you crossed over. You're going to be a Hebrew. You're going to live under this authority, 
right? Oh, yes. Say amen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. What is a tablet and a testimony? It is the word, right? It's the word of God. I wish I had like three hours to teach you about all that. Huh? Well, right, the the tablets with the ten sayings on them are representative of all the commandments, right? Just the two commandments. We should have said, they said, they're going to come trap him up, right? What's the most important commandment? Oh, Shema Yisrael, right? Love the Lord your God, what we already said, with all your very muchness, and love your neighbor as yourself, okay? On these two, loving God and loving your neighbor, um, hang everything else, okay? So if we look at the however many there are, if there's 613 or not, I don't know. I haven't tried to count them. Do you know where the 613 came from? You know I'm talking about 613? <clears throat> so somebody went, uh, uh, I mean, lots of people have gone through the Torah and tried to distill out what the, what the, how many there are. Why, if I tell you why you, they pick 613, you can kind of laugh. Anyway, it's from the 9th century. There was a famous guy named Sa'adia Gaon. I'm going to leave all this up, I hope if I don't run out of space. And he's the one who developed the number 613. And so there are 365 negative commandments, one for each day of the year. And then there are 248 commandments, positive commandments, and that's for the number of bones in your body. All right. <laughs> there aren't 248 bones in your body, but that's what they said. So that's how they came to that number. And it's a kind of a, just a random number. You can pull up lists of them, and you can find them, and they are kind of random. Some of them are one sentence, and some of them are two paragraphs. So how he made these decisions, I don't know, okay? Um, but though, however there are any there are, th- those are distilled down into the ten, which Yahweh wrote himself with the finger of God on those tablets, and then Yeshua distilled them down to the two. Okay, they all represent one thing. This is something about Hebrew thinking you, like you need to understand. It would be helpful for you to understand is that we have this idea of, of distillation and expansion. Um, so when Yeshua is hanging on the cross and he says, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani, everybody that's standing there goes in their mind to the whole rest of the psalm. Okay, he wasn't making some statement or some kind of, uh, oh, God has abandoned me and I'm stuck here. And blah, blah, blah. Not at all. Okay, you need to read the rest of the psalm because if he says that, you know, if you, you've been married for a long time and uh, your wife says something and you finish a sentence, right? Have you had that nice experience, right? Because you know each other and you know how each other thinks and that's how we are with God, okay? If I say one sentence, you can finish it because you know the words of the book. Okay, 22. All right, can't teach you about Ten Commandments, don't have time. Okay, but it's the word of God. All right, we, that, we're going to put that. Now, who, out of, who what, what a person, what is the title of the person who brings the word of God? Who does that in the hierarchy? No, the prophet. Okay. Oh, we just fell off. And I'll leave this up so that y'all can take a picture of it. All right, last thing was the manna. What is the manna? What is it? What is, oh, yeah. Manna, manna, makarapo, manna. <laughs> it means if, if it happened now, we would just call it what's it? That's what it means, right? But what was it? What was it for? Food. Okay. Um, and... If I, if I don't say priest, if I say pastor, then you can hear he's the one that feeds the sheep. Okay? So you have a pastor here. We do say priest, but the idea is that the pastor needs to feed the sheep. Okay. We'll skip the history of famine. Um, is there going to be manna again? What do you think? 
There might be. I, I'm looking forward to tasting it myself. Okay. Now, there's another thing we need to put on this list here, and I'm going to erase these squiggles so I can fit it. And that's First Timothy one seven. God has not given us. Oh, it's Second Timothy. Wrong Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Let's see. We're wandering off into the, uh, into the outer court here. But nothing takes place back here, so it's all right. Where, where would the power be? Well, I think the king. We, can we agree that the king is here? The power. Love and a sound mind. Absolutely. Your sound mind comes from your word. I'm going to tell you, this is love. Okay, the love goes with the food. We're going to see it. We're going to see it in your soul. Uh, the pastor's the administrator of that. He's here to make sure that everybody loves each other. Right? Taking care of the sheep, the flock. That's the love. The sound mind comes from the word of oh God. That's the prophet's job, to make sure that you're in your right mind. Hey, you people are not keeping the law, and if you don't get on up with it, you're going to be in exile. But nobody paid attention. Instead, they put Jeremiah in a pit. He said, look, we don't like what you're saying. Just go rot down here because we don't want to hear it anymore. Okay? Those people were not in their right mind. Okay? Jeremiah was in his right mind. Okay? So we see this also. This is all parallel. Uh, the three parts of the human being. Tablets is the word. Administer the prophet. Yeah, it's a little messy, but it is a prophet. Okay. Uh, good. All right. Now, um, and, and we've had a lot of teaching, and you all know the answers, and that's great. And I'm very happy. Thank you for your participation. We're going to go to the outer court, which represents the body, okay? Because everybody has one. Everybody knows how they work, right? And uh, the hardest thing for us to deal with is this middle thing, which is going to be your soul. All right. First of all, this is the only area that's entirely exposed to view, okay? A lot of times we think that... Um, People don't really know what's going on inside us or something like that. But I want to tell you something. Everybody can see. They see all your behavior. They see how you treat yourself, how you treat other people, your relationships. It's all visible. Okay? And the, the outer court is the only thing that's totally visible. Okay? That represents your, um, your flesh. Now... Your body has certain needs to stay alive, doesn't it? Right? You learned this in science class in about the third grade. What do you need to stay alive? Water. No water, you die. What else? Air. Okay, I'm going to put air at the bottom. <laughs> Food. One more thing. Essential. Your body can live for a long time without love. People are crazy. People do crazy things. You can physically, like a robot, go through life, but uh, without love. Shelter. Okay, shelter is like clothing. Well, your clothing is part of your shelter. Okay? And there's one other thing that we're going to see in Scripture that you can make a, a small case for. So there's, um, there's plenty of Scriptures. For example, in Genesis forty-seven fifteen. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? Okay? How long has anybody, anybody done a 40-day fast here? No 40 days. How about three weeks? Anybody? At least one. Yom Kippur, right? Five days. Okay, right. Oh, I mean, you got to go past five days. I mean, everybody says the third day is the worst, but to me, the fifth day is the worst. Okay, after a while, you can just start cruising, <laughs> and you feel pretty, pretty good. It gives you a lot of extra time, because not only do you not have to eat, but you don't have to think about when you're going to eat or what to eat, right? Um, most of my problem is thinking about, what am I going to eat next? And that's a generationally inherited curse. 
because whenever we went to my mom's house after, you know, we were out, come back and visit, as soon as we finished lunch, there was planning for dinner, right? That's just how it was, okay? You have no food, you die. Uh, how about water? Exodus 17.3, and the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Where, why? I have an extra word there. Why is this that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Okay, you really can't go more than three days without water unless you're Moses on the mountain or Yeshua in the wilderness. Okay? All right. How about shelter? Judges 6.2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds, okay? People need to be in some place, all right? There's also, um, when, I don't have it, when she was talking about, you know, why should you uh, worry about what you wear, okay? So either you've got to have a place to live, you've got to have clothing, right? And there's one other thing which we don't consider um, as essential to life, but it really is, and that's reproduction, and there is a little scripture for it. Um, Rachel, in Genesis 30, verse 1, Ra- Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children. She envied her sister, and she said unto Jacob, Give me children, or else I'm going to die. Would she really probably have died? I mean, I've never had any children. I'm still here. <laughs> so, um, But in the long-term thinking in the culture, obviously, if there are no children, the whole race dies out. Okay, for her, you know, we were talking a little bit about Hebrew, the position of the woman. um, We were talking about that movie, Kadosh, right? It is um, in the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, if your wife does not have children, you have the right to divorce her. Okay, it's that important to them to, um, to reproduce. Okay? And people worry about all their needs of their flesh. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor for your body, what you shall put on. Not, uh, not the life more than the, is life, is not, is not life more than meat and body more than raiment, okay? Behold the fowls of the air, you know the rest of the story. You don't have to worry about those things. These are the needs of your flesh. Now, the air, breathing is not mentioned, okay? And, and so I think that's specifically interesting. But the fact is, you can't not breathe. Do you ever do that when you're a kid? I'm so mad. I'm just going to hold my breath till I die. Eventually, you breathe or you pass out and you start breathing, okay? Breathing is automatic. So I don't think we can work. Gee, I, I got up this morning. I wondered, wow, I wonder if there's going to be enough air to breathe today. I wonder what air I'm going to breathe after lunch, okay? So you don't have, it's automatic. And I believe that's why it's not mentioned. You do need clean air. Um, That's why I think it's not mentioned, because we don't worry about it, okay? All right. Now, what is this that goes all the way around the outer court? You know what it is? What's it made out of? White linen, curtains of white linen. Oh, that's me. Curtains of white linen. What do you know about white linen? It's pure. Who's wearing it? The priests and the saints, right? In Revelation, for example, 19.8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Okay? You have skin, and this is how you should be arrayed, in white linen, the outer courts. Okay? Now, uh, your flesh has some problems, but also has some needs. Now, one thing I want to talk about just for a second is Gnosticism. You all know about Gnosticism, right? Gnosticism is an a age-old uh, religious kind of philosophy, okay? And became very, very prevalent um, after Yeshua's death where people had to make a decision uh, or think about the theology, how how to set that down. Was Yeshua really God and man? And the Gnostics decided no. They decided 
He was man while he was walking around, and then after he was crucified, he became God somehow, thing like that. Okay, Gnosticism always involves um, secret knowledge. Hey, you can join my cult. We have all the secrets. I think there was a movie that came out pretty recently, The Secret, right? It was a new age thing about how to focus your thoughts so you could get that new Cadillac or million dollars, right? You know, lies from the pit of hell, okay? Now, what happens in Gnosticism is that they're basically dividing your body from your spirit. And the spirit becomes worth everything, and the body becomes worth nothing, okay? Now, this manifests in two opposite behaviors. One is the people who are, uh, you know, they want to focus on the spirit, so they beat their bodies, okay? You know, maybe you've seen some of this, the Catholic monks or some, you know, you just deliberately inflict pain on yourself, on your physical being, so that your spirit can fly away. Uh, Or you don't care what you do with your physical being, and you involve yourself in all kinds of hedonism, and just do whatever you want, because your body doesn't matter anyway. It's just your spirit that matters, okay? This is the essence of Gnosticism. Now, the essence of Hebrew thought is that you are one human being, and you need all these things to function. And all these things should reflect the glory of God, okay? So it's important to understand that. Um, the flesh, is a, so is the flesh good or bad? Well, you have to have it, okay? Um, but it does not measure up to the spirit, all right? It is corruptible. And you know uh, when, when the resurrection comes, it says the dead will be raised incorruptible. Your current flesh is corruptible. You get to a certain point in, of age and you say, oh, wow, this stinks. <laughs> My flesh is corrupted. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded, to be focused on the physical flesh, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind, the mind that's in the flesh, is at enmity, hates God. It is not subject to the Torah of God. Your flesh is not subject to the Torah of God. All right? And it can't be. It can't be. We we shouldn't even try and make it be that. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Does that mean if you're living in a body, you can't please God? No. It means if that's how you think, and you're always focused on the the next meal, the next clothing, the next pride of life, I'm going to get this $100,000. If you're focused on that stuff, it says right here, I'm not telling you this, that I made it up and I'm trying to condemn you. It says here, you cannot please God if you're carnally minded. You have to be focused on your spirit. Do you need your body? Good, because you have no place else to live right? You have to have it, okay? John 3, 6, you know that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. This is um, something that it, it doesn't make sense to us, and we can't wrap our mind around it because our concept of the commandments is things that we do. In other words, I eat this way. I go to this festival I say these prayers, but we don't understand God's economy. These things that you do in your flesh are spiritual. Paul says the law is spiritual. This is what feeds your spirit. They're things that you do in your flesh. They're going to feed your spirit or they're going to knock your spirit down. All right. The flesh is not a spiritual entity. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? It's not designed to last forever. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me. We'll get to the will in a minute. But uh, to perform that which is good in my flesh, I can't, I can't find it. I can't figure it out. Okay? What happened to the disciples? The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. The flesh is at enmity with spiritual things. When the flesh hears Torah, it rises up and says, no, I will not do that. Ah, You can't make me. Well, the thing is you can make him do it, but you have to do it from your spirit, through your soul, 
to your flesh, okay? Now, the flesh does bear the outward signs, okay? What was the first symbol that uh, Abraham got as a sign of the covenant? What was it? Circumcision. It's in your flesh. It's something that you do, not you do, and certainly not to yourself. Well, I guess Abraham circumcised himself. I don't want to know how all that worked out. (laughs) Kind of funky. All right. God provides for all your needs in your flesh that you need. But, uh, and there's a remedy for dealing with the problems of your flesh, these lusts and things. There's a remedy for that as shown in the tabernacle. When you come in the tabernacle, uh, what's here? The altar. The altar and the laver. These are the uh, implements, accoutrements, whatever, of, of the... Um, of the outer court. And these are the remedies how to deal with your flesh, okay? What happens at the altar, right? All the blood, your throat's slit. Well, you can't say anything now because your throat's slit, right? You have no blood. There's no life in you, okay? Now, are we talking about, I'm not, please, don't go out here and commit suicide, okay? (laughs) That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about the flesh-minded man. You have to put it to death. You have to. And that's a struggle. The struggle is going to take place right here in the soul. We're going to get to it in a minute. Okay? And then, um, and then the laver. So what is the laver? It's the washing, the washing place. Um, do you know what it was made of? It was made of bronze. What did they? The mirrors, okay? The mirrors that the women brought out of Egypt. Now, they didn't have glass mirror in that day. They had a polished bronze or some kind of metal polished very high. I bet you couldn't see like every flaw in your face in that thing. <laughs> no, we have very good mirrors now, right? So what does it say um, about the mirrors? About uh, James 1, 23, 25. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. Okay, so when you look into the water of the word, you are looking into a mirror, and that is totally represented here, right? You have the water. The water is the word. Do you know that? Say yes. If not, say, I will go home and study tonight. Okay? He beholds himself. He looks at himself, and then he goes away, and what happens? He forgets the manner of man that he is but who so looks into the perfect Torah of liberty, he looks in, the same person looks into the word, he's looking in a mirror, you look in the word, you're looking in a mirror, how do I, you know, compare to this thing? And he continues in, in it, in the word, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man is blessed indeed, okay? So here's your opportunities to deal with the lust of your flesh. Slit your throat, be quiet. Look in the water of the word. Look at yourself. How do you measure up inside the water of the word? Okay, and be a doer of the word. That's a different sermon. It says um, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Okay, somewhere when you look in that mirror and you look in that word, and see yourself, you better see the glory of the Lord in you, right? But later, uh, I'm sorry, we are changed. We are changed from into the same image, from glory to glory. Okay, right now we're seeing a glass darkly, right? Later, face to face. Okay, sacrifice. You have to learn how to sacrifice yourself. I think that's required, right? Isn't sacrifice required? No temple in Jerusalem. Don't go there. Don't be killing any animals. What kind of sacrifices can you offer right now? Huh? Praise. Praise, Sacrifice of praise. Thanksgiving. Paul said he was poured out like a drink offering. What did he mean? Everything he did was for the Lord. What are some things that we do that are just for the Lord that that don't do... uh, that they're not for us. You have kids? Serve your kids? Do you have to lay yourself down to serve your kids? Yeah, I hope so. Serve your spouse? Serve your neighbor? 
Okay, this is all a sacrifice. You have to put yourself down. You have to put yourself aside. Um, participate in the sacrifice. Okay? All right. Here we are. We're at the soul, finally. The soul, and, and several people have said this, the soul develops when the spirit comes into contact with the body. Okay? The spirit is spirit. The flesh is flesh. But something develops, and that is your soul. Okay? I'm, I'm not in conflict with anything uh, that has been taught. Uh, I might just phrase some things a little differently about now. Okay. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between your soul and your spirit, but it is possible because Hebrews tells you that the word of God is sharper than two-edged sword and, can, and it can split those things. So the nephesh, let me give you that number, which I don't have here. Never mind. Yes, I do. 5315. That's your Strong's number. And, and it's frequently translated in different ways. It's translated soul. It's translated as mind. It's translated as uh, emotions. I'm going to show you a chart in a minute about all the places where the nephesh appears. Now, uh, I think somebody said, right, your body is not who you are. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right? Now, maybe it's, it's kind of funny. I would, have li- I would like to have the body that I had when I was 20 years old, but I don't want the spiritual experience and soul of the person who was 20 years old. I don't want that because, wow, I was unredeemed and uh, ignorant and all kind of horrible things. So... Um, so your body is not who you are. Your, your body is a, um, is a vehicle, okay? It's like if you have a computer, okay? Say I have a computer. Even, even if you're like the smartest programmer on the planet, okay? If, if you take that computer apart and look at all the parts of it, it will not tell you, can you send an email? It will not tell you, can you type a document? Can you draw a picture? The hardware will not tell you that, okay? You need to know the software to know that, okay? So your computer, the outside, is your hardware. Your soul is your software. Uh, and, and there's lots of scripture that shows that the nephesh of the person is the person. For example, uh, there's certain sins where it says, that soul shall be cut off. Okay, that's the nephesh. That person is cut off from the camp, okay? Um, It's not his spirit that's cut off, and it's not his body that's cut off. His soul, the person. Um, Now, uh, let's just skip that. (laughs) Okay, you have uh, three functions in your soul. You have your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now... I'm, I'm, I'm just going to show you this chart. I hope it's just going to spontaneously appear when I open my computer. In every one of these scriptures, the word that's used is soul, regardless of what your translation is. And so I group them into um, these three categories so that you can see what they are. So on the left of column is your mind. And if you want this chart... It's called Functions of the Soul, and um, just email me, and I'll, I'll just send it to you, okay? And the scripture is talking about knowledge. That's in your mind, right? Knowledge is your mind. Uh, talking about memory, okay? Your memory is in your mind. Wisdom, okay? Uh, uh, the scripture is about thinking. These are all functions of the mind, Okay? In the middle column is your emotions, and there sure are a lot of them, okay? I've got uh, mourning, uh, M-O-U-R-N, feeling sad, right? Love, rejoicing, uh, bitterness is in your soul. It's an emotion, being vexed, being sorrowful. Pleasure is in your soul. Abhorrence, that means hatred, and uh, anguish. These are all functions of your soul. It says in the scripture, it uses the word nephesh, no matter what your translation says. And this is not hard to find out. You know, there's lots and lots of good Bible software that teach that, all right? And then uh, for your will, making a decision is out of your soul. In your will, uh, self-discipline, 
That's a de- that's a decision that I don't make very well. I'll just confess that. Uh, patience. Patience requires waiting. That's an issue of will. Um, vows. If you pr- make a promise, that's an issue of will, what you decide to do. Um, and also your desires. Some of your desires are issues of will. Okay? So all these things, I just want you to see that... Um, this is what the scripture says about these things. Okay, we're going to talk about it in a minute. Now, uh, we looked at a, a scripture before, Proverbs 23, 7. And it says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Okay, it doesn't say heart. It doesn't use the word lev at all. It uses the word nephesh. All right, there's scripture that shows that your nephesh, your soul, is the gateway it's a gatekeeper. It's a gatekeeper going from here to here. All right? Everything goes this way. This way. And then it comes out here. Okay? It's, uh, whatever you are uh, from your spirit comes to your soul. Your soul is the mediator of these things. And whatever it mediates to, that's what's going to come out your body. There's a scripture that says... My soul waits on God, okay? So waiting is a matter of discipline. It's a matter of the will. And, um, and if we wait, then we'll do the right thing, okay? You, you got to hear from here. Move here, and then by your will, and wh- what lines up, that's going to manifest in your flesh, Okay? All right, we have lots and lots of emotions. How do we deal with that? Not very well sometimes. All right, let's see. So there's, there's remedies for all these things in the holy place. So what is in the holy place? What are the... the okay, a table of showbread. That's up here. Bread. Here's the menorah here. One, two, three, seven. The incense. Okay, this is a little smoke going up, okay? I'm a very bad artist. Uh, okay, so what... Uh, oh, look. Here's food and here's food. How about that? Let's see. There's a scripture that says, Thy word is a lamb, right? Oh, look, here's a word and here's the word. See, here's food, and here's a word, okay? We'll find out how these are connected, because you know they got to be. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here, right? So the menorah is the word. It represents the word of God. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Proverbs 6, 23. The commandment is a lamp. And the Torah is light. We're going to skip out. I spend an hour teaching you about the menorah. We're not going to do that. Now, understanding wisdom and knowledge, we have the word for that. And so this is the remedy for your mind, for your stinking thinking. Maybe you, uh, you were listening to uh, Gary Tunsky, and he told you not to eat fast food, and maybe that was news to you. I hope it wasn't. But if it was news to you, you didn't have the information. Some people, not everybody grows up eating properly. And I think the longer we go on, the worse it gets. Um, <sighs> I was sitting in a, I don't know, in a restaurant one time, eating something vaguely healthy. And there's a young couple next to me. And the boy said to the girl, well, meat and potatoes, that's the most healthy thing you can eat, right? And I think maybe I was even a vegetarian at the time, and I just inwardly rolled my eyes <laughs> inside my head, right? Maybe it's not the healthiest thing you can eat. Maybe I shouldn't have been in a restaurant. That was a bad witness. Okay. Sometimes we just need information, okay? You remember when you, when you, the day that it popped out at you from the Bible that said, do these things forever, and you thought about your Sunday church and said, but we're not doing these things. What does forever mean? And, and somebody gave you some bad information that said, oh, these things are not for you. 
or these things have been done away with, and that, that was wrong information. But the right information, you know where to find the right information, see? And it came live to you. You didn't have the right information, so you had to change your mind, okay? You didn't have to change your will or emotions. You probably had a lot of emotions at the time that it happened, right? But you had to change your mind. So the Word of God is the remedy for your mind when, th when you have that stinking thinking going on. Now, the bread. When do we see the, the people are eating? People had dinner with God. That might have been quite awesome, right, on Sinai. What do we consider when, when, we, uh, when we're eating together, right? The, the kind of fellowship, right? The food represents a fellowship, right? There's a, a loaf of bread for each tribe, right? And Paul talks about some people, they're so evil. He says, don't even sit down and eat with those people. Okay, we're out of fellowship with them. What is the food? It's the love. It's the remedy for your what? For your emotions. This is really important. I'm going to take a minute and talk about it. People who are emotionally disabled for whatever reason... What do you find them doing? They're going from church to church to fellowship to change this. You know, I understand if, you know, Torah is something new to you and you want to go to a different fellowship. And maybe you need to go to two or three to find the one you belong. But you understand what I'm talking about? People who can't receive love because of some hurt in their emotions, they're going to go from place to place to place. They're going to go from person to person to person. Well, this happened to me, and blah, 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 blah. And you put up with that person for a while. And that for a while, you give them several, you know, good things so that you need to change your thinking. You need to get delivered, whatever it is. Blah, 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 blah. You don't love me anymore. Call the other guy. You, you know, I have this problem. Blah, blah, blah. And they just go from person to person to person. Our fellowships need to be safe places where people can be trusted, where people can process their junk because you've got it. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not excluding myself. Everybody's got something, okay? Your fellowship, whatever that looks like, if it's your family, if it's three families, if it's 199 families, and if it is 199 families, you better have cell groups. You better have small groups where people can be free. I was in a church service one time, <coughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't remember how it came up, but the person began to talk about their depression which they had been suffering for 10 years, and they were afraid to tell anybody in church about it because they felt like they'd be condemned. Okay, this is horrible. It, it does, it, yeah, it happens. But we need to know how, and you don't have to wait till you're all cleaned up to minister to somebody else, okay? And you can let your small children minister because they don't have the baggage. <laughs> You know, and they know how to come in, in a kind of an emotional purity and pray for you or whatever it takes, all right? The remedy for people with broken emotions is shown here. It's shown here. The pastor is the administrator of that. In Luke 24, 30 and 31, it came to pass. He says he sat at the meal with them. He took the bread as Yeshua and blessed the Lord, and broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and then he vanished out of sight, right? It's a place where we want to see Yeshua in our interactions between us, right? Okay, that's the road to Emmaus. The, the bread is what sustains you. It gives you strength, um, you know, uh, what happened, David got caught in the middle of the battle. He had, to go in. he had to go in and eat the showbread. That was illegal for him, but he needed the sustenance, okay? You, you do, Chris, you're right. You need love to grow, you know, to be a human being in this life. We, we do have to have it. We talk about the altar of incense. What is, what is incense? What does it represent? The prayers of the saints, that's right. I guess it's going to go, <coughs> it's right here. Well, now this is easy because there's only one thing left. It's, gonna, it's the remedy for your will. Prayer is the remedy for your will. 
okay? Because you're not going to be born, and even if you're born again, with the immediate idea that you want to be perfectly obedient. I'll tell you who gets that idea right away, the oldest child. Oh, the oldest child's always going to be perfectly obedient until they get to that point of rebellion <laughs> in their life. But the oldest child always ready to please, okay? But that's a pleasing of man, okay? So even if, if you are like that initially, when you become a believer, you still have to transfer that to, I'm going to please the Lord, okay? I'm sure everybody's uh, one so rebellious as me in their life, okay? Prayers. Now, there is one prayer that shows you that's the only way to change your will, and that is the prayer that Yeshua prayed in the garden, right? If Yeshua had to pray, let your will be done and not mine, then we certainly have to pray it, okay? The point is, uh, and and I think in in Torah walk, we get very um, excited about the word, and we're and our minds are full, and we're just learning, 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 learning. We got a full brain here, you know, <clears throat> and that's great. But it doesn't really always change your behavior at all. It doesn't make you feel better if you're emotionally broken. You do need the word if you're emotionally broken, because you need to be reading Psalm 139 every single night before you go to bed, so you know how God made you and how much He loves you and the purpose He made you for. And and that's good to fill your mind with that stuff, and that can help your emotions. You do need to be in relationship, though, to really fill your emotions. The point is, for example, um, I don't know if they're still doing it, but there was a drug-something resistance education, right? It was D-A-R. It was a program that was in the the grade schools, D-A-R-E, right? And they take kids. They don't want kids to smoke cigarettes, right? So they take them and they show them, pictures of lungs that are all black and full of charcoal and tar, and they say, don't smoke cigarettes. But those people smoke cigarettes anyway, right? It's not all about education, and we need to remember that because we're very educated people, and we know the Torah, and we know it, you know, and when to count the moon and all how to pronounce the name, right? It's, that's what it, I'm not saying... I'm not gonna minimize that stuff. We need that stuff, but we need a lot more. We need a lot more in this war, in this walk, right? We love to pray, but what are we praying for? The Father's will to be done. Well, I prayed for that. I didn't think it was gonna turn out like this, God. You know, <laughs> well, I, oh, okay. But it's His will, not your will. That's how you change your will. That's a remedy for your will. Is the prayer prayers in accordance with God's word and your emotions. Yes, they can be healed by prayer. Yes, they can be healed by the word. But you need to be in relationship. I like this. I like this suit coat. Everybody's very nice. Everybody's friendly with each other. When you go home to your congregation, please take that with you. Try and get along with people. <laughs> I'm I'm in a very small congregation in Athens, Georgia, and it it's sort of nice. It's kind of self cleansing. Like people come and. They want to be in charge of stuff. Well, we don't have any in charge of stuff people. So after a while, they get tired of waiting for their promotion, you know, and and they leave. Um, Oh, you know, the people come with the latest and greatest word, and they just want to talk about that the whole time. And, man, are you sick of prophecy yet? Are you sick of prophecy yet? No, of course not. But I'm pretty sick of all the predictions that are coming out, right? I have my own personal saying. The occurrence of the events will answer all your questions, okay? We don't have to know that, okay? We do need to know the rules for being in relationship with each other, being nice with each other. How to shut up, I mean, when you have to shut up, right? Remember the out of court at the altar, slit your throat, let all the blood drain out, let the life of that flesh man who wants to be right, instead of wanting to be righteous, there's times to shut your mouth, right? You don't, you don't have to know it all. Just, just not, no, <laughs> just kidding, okay? <laughs> all right, now I'll, um, we're going to see, actually, uh, let's go to Acts 2.42, and this is a, a summary of, of uh, what we're seeing here, because Acts 42, <laughs> it's so funny, people, like, uh, you go to some Christian church, oh, well, we're an Acts church, we just do what's a, right? You're laughing, right? 
We just do what's in Acts. Oh, really? No, you're not doing what's in Acts, right? Oh, right, because there's no instruments in Acts. We have no instruments in our church. Whatever. Okay. What are they doing? They're steadfast in the doctrine. Where would I put the doctrine here? I think in the word, huh? Uh, no, no, this has nothing to do with the cord. It has to do with this word being with this word, being with this word down here. I didn't write it in very good order, did I? Okay. In fellowship and the breaking of bread, that goes together, right? They're doing this, fellowship and the breaking of bread. And in the prayers. Do I have this in the right order? The bread is here. The word is here. The authority is here. Okay. We have our own personal authority. That's our will. Okay. The idea is to subject your authority to the king's authority by prayer. Okay. You have to subject the word, your thinking, uh, to the king's word up here the word that the prophet brings, that will give you a sound mind, good doctrine, okay? Your emotions, you have to subject to love, and it says God is love, Yahweh, that is, is love, right? With the bread, the fellowship, administered by the pastor, the word goes with the word. Your soul is perfectly designed to be subject to the Spirit of God. Okay, if these, if these cubby, cubby holes didn't match up, then you couldn't be like the Spirit of God. But they're designed to perfectly match up. And so your soul is the place of the battle. There's many other things here we could talk about. We're not going to talk about them. Sorry. All right. Now, it happens in the whole... Uh, of time, that there are just three days. You know there are just three days? Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Okay, there's only three days. In, uh, uh, particularly in Hebrew, there are only three times, three verb tenses, the past, the present, and the future. Okay, salvation requires the same process. Um, I imagine there are a few people, or maybe more than a few people, who uh, initially learned wherever they learned it, that they could walk down an aisle, give their life to Jesus, get the golden ticket, go to heaven, finished. Right? I want to tell you something. I hope you did that, but that was yesterday. <laughs> okay? Today, you are walking now, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's still going on. Okay? It's a process. It's very clear in Hebrew thinking it's what we call halacha, right? The halacha is the walk, and you just got to keep walking. Are you going to mess up? Definitely. Uh, it says the, um, the righteous fall seven times a day, but they get off their duff. No, God picks them up, and you keep walking. So you, uh, you were saved on that day in 1952. You are being saved currently today. But what does it say about salvation? He who endures till the end, he will be saved. So there's a future salvation. I don't know what that looks like, and I'm not going to try and project it. But we're in today. We're in the process of trying to accomplish all these things according to the word of Torah. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me speak to you.